Welcome, you're watching The Real Medvite, and yes, this is going to be a, uh, it's going to be a pretty long video, isn't it? But it has to be talked about, we have to talk about this uh, article, if you've seen my talk with Luke Kendrat, we talked about this stupid website uh, for a long time. So let's just start with this article. Okay, so this article, written Michael Sisko White, I'm not going to read that, in Loyalty in the Orthodox Church by Lydia Brungrad. Uh, this article, yeah, this is, we're not going to, this article doesn't matter. This is toilet paper. Okay, so print this article out, use it as a toilet paper, flush it down the toilet because that's really all this article is. It's a worthless piece of garbage. We're not going to be talking about this one. We're going to be talking about this little thing written by the same Ledyo Bagrad. On being orthodox and gender queer, an interview with Lindsay. Oh, I'm I'm an I'm gender queer orthodox guys. Look at me. Oh uh, yes, we're gonna be dealing with these people now. Um, because why not, right? Why not? So I I, I saw that article about Michael Sisko. Now I don't know about Michael Sisko, but I, I can already guess. You know the fact that this and that is being done by the same people. Anyone sane probably knows that it's it's a worthless pile of garbage and it's probably full of slander because all of, all these people do is slander and attack Orthodox Christians. They're no different than satanic persecutors in any era, really. But what we're going to be doing here, we're not, I'm not just going to review this article. No, no, no. We're going to read this truth together. We're going to be reading the entirety of it and I'm going to commentate it for you. And we're going to have a lot of fun seeing the kind of stuff because this is a very good insight into the leftist mind zombie, okay? This is a very good insight into how they think, how they try to justify themselves. Let's just go through it so that we don't have to deal with it again, okay? And I want to finally say it, you know, if there are any priests or bishops watching this or if anyone who knows a priest, knows a bishop, you know, you priest in your church, maybe you have a good relationship with your bishop, you know... You can let them know about this and ask them, you know, what do you think about this, Father? What do you think about this article? Should people that do articles like this be allowed? And why is nothing being done against this? It's a very, very innocent question. In fact, let me ask a further question. Why is the OCA, for example, listening to the demands brought about this group because for example again remember the luke kendrat show from you know orthodoxy first my appearance there you remember what we talked about right the fa father mark hodges the do you, do you remember who um attacked them sent that letter to the bishops and the bishops who did the bishops listen to the same group of people that we are showing to you right now this group of people these are the people who Attack Father Mark Hodges. So the bishops listen to them, but in this regard, they say they stay silent. Is it because they like this, or is it because they don't want to deal with it? You know, I don't have the answers. The bishops have the answers. If you want the answers so much, go ask them. Go ahead. But again, we're going to be dealing with this article. We're already going to. I mean, you you can already guess how much pain and misery we're going to have just reading through this nonsense um but yeah let's just let's just start Let, let's just begin start i've already introduced yourself uh just prepare yourself you're not gonna have fun looking at this um look at this flag disgusting all right let's start this likely represents one of the most controversial articles that orthodoxy and dialogue will ever published that's I don't know what an orthodoxy in dialogue is. All I know is paganism in dialogue. The dismissiveness, outrage, or mockery that will elicit in certain orthodox circles is entirely and sadly predictable. Huh. So are you saying we should not be dismissive? We should not be outraged that this is happening? So... That's not going to protect you, okay? That is not going to protect you. Let me give you an example. Let's say I made a tweet and I said, 
Hey guys, I just murdered someone today and I'm going to defend why murder is actually not a bad thing. And of course, there's going to be people being dismissive and outraged, but you know, it's so sad that people are just going to be mad at me murdering people. That's not going to protect me. Okay? That's not going to protect anyone. And now now you might say, "Oh, David, that's crazy. You think murder and homosexuality is equal?" Well, actually, apologies are in order. Yes, I'm, I am very sorry for associating you people with murder, murderers. I'm very sorry. It's a grave insult to murderers to be associated with homosexuals. Indeed, as St. John Chrysostom says, homosexuality is worse than murder because murder kills the body. Homosexuality kills the body and the soul. That's what St. John Chrysostom says. You can Google that if you want to. You can look that up. Um, so yeah, actually, I'm, I'm apologies to the murderers. I was too harsh with you. I'm very sorry to you. So let's let's move on. Conducted on June 25, 25th, two thousand eighteen. This interview introduces our readers to Bregrad's doctrinal research in gender, cultural heritage, and conversion in the Orthodox Church. Basically, meaningless stuff, meaningless stuff, and meaningful stuff that is probably being portrayed as meaningless. Uh, yeah. It invites her subject to share their experience of being orthodox. I'm sorry, she. I misgendered her. I'm sorry. Sorry, I misgendered you. She invites her subject to share their experience of being orthodox and a seminarian while not identifying as... Um, the, the, the things that don't exist. Uh, paganism in dialogue does not normally allow the use of pseudonyms. In this case, we have made a rare exception based on the importance of Lenzai's witness in our ongoing discussion of uh, John Money and David Reimer and the need to ensure their safety and well-being in the church. We have communicated with them directly and know their identity. Ooh, this is going to be interesting. So Lydia is the person that's making the interview. It's a femoid. Um, that's standard Michael Cisco and whatnot. Lindsay is, uh, well, let's just, let's just ask what Lindsay thinks of us. Uh, who's Lindsay? Hi, my name is, I'm going to make the voice. Okay. <clears throat> Lydia voice. Let's, let's prepare ourselves because this is going to be a long ride. So we should just enjoy ourselves. Okay. I'm going to take it slow, not too serious. We're going to have fun. Okay. Because that is very important because if we didn't have fun, we'd be depressed reading this. <laughs> Please introduce yourself for our readers. Okay, Lindsay was. Hi, my name is Lindsay, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am white, middle class, on the autistic spectrum of disorders, and have major depression, for which I am in treatment. I am often read as masculine. I grew up in different parts of California. My parents converted to orthodoxy, and I grew up attending liturgy and vespers every week. So, it's a, so this is a cradle dox. Converto to cradle dox, I think. You identify as genderqueer. Can you talk about what that word means to you and how you came to identify this way? I don't like really, I don't really like labels myself, but we still have to speak a language. Gender, to me, is the meaning we give to being embodied, which is intimately linked with sex. The physical composition of our bodies, the meanings of the two may come from culture, society, family of origin, none of the regulated roles contained under male or female or anything else really fits my identity. I will almost prefer to think of m myself as a gender. <laughs> a gender. I don't experience moving from one gender expression to another. I feel outside of the gender space. Wow, Lindsay transcends the dialectics. Wow, really genius. Lindsay graduated from the from the school of of uh, post dialectics. I just transcend. I don't believe in the gender dialectics. <laughs> it's like, oh man, give me a break. Give me a break. There's a tendency to collapse sex and gender and use those words interchangeably, but we do ourselves a disservice there. They are ultimately inseparable. But they're very much distinct. So, okay. Let's ask, our, ask ourselves a question here. Um, 
Where do we see this in the church fathers? We don't. Oh, we see this in science, psychology, right? That stuff. You know, you know, because psychologists are so much better than the church fathers. But do you know what's better? Do you know what's better? This uh, explanation of gender, sex, and whatnot. Do you know who it originates from? I said their name. I said his name in this video once. John Money. John Money. Money John. John the Money Man. Money the Man John. John the Money Man. John Money. Okay, John Money. Um, did a certain experiment with a person named David Reimer. And you can only kind of see what's happening, but psychologist John Money oversaw the case and reported reassignments as successful. And, and all I'm going to say is John Money did a reassignment by Zynga. I'm not going to go too much into detail because you really need to check this up for yourself. I don't think I can talk about this. this is too disgusting, okay? But basically... Sex resignment stuff, genital mutilation, all that kind of stuff. David Reimer ended up killing himself. Okay, he ended up killing himself because of the experiences he was put through John Money. But John Money, right? John, John the Money Man. John the Money Man is a very respected academic, apparently. Um, and he is the one introducing the terms gender identity, gender role, and sexual orientation. He is the one who introduces these terms. And this is the kind of freak that introduces th this nonsense to us. So, don't forget, right? Now, you might say, oh, you're just associate. No, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Landred, Lydia Brengbrud, Lindy, Lydia Femoid. Isn't that exactly what you're doing here? Oh, that's exactly what you're doing. Now, let me tell you something. Being a white nationalist or whatever... Being a right winger, I will rather be a right winger than be on the same side as John Money. That that's definitely I will I will openly declare that. And just because Michael now, as as I said, I don't know a lot about Michael. So I do know that he is not a WS. I do know that. I do know that he's not a WS. Okay, I do know that he's not one of those people. Um, and I do know. That this is a toilet paper article full of lies. And I do know that what Lydia is trying to imply with Michael is not true. But here's what's happening, right? If you're right of Bernie Sanders, you're associated with perpetuating uh, national socialism. You're associated with perpetuating racism and all of these kind of isms, right? Even if, all, like, you can be, like, the most basic baby boy, like, libertarian capitalist, and that even those people will be attacked us, you know, whatever. So that's completely fine, but when I associate you with John Money, which actually association is pretty strong because you guys are the same kind of people with John Money. You do the same kind of stuff that John Money does. You perpetuate the same kind of stuff John Money did uh, to David Reimer and what's happening to thousands and perhaps even millions of kids worldwide um you want to disassociate yourself with them no no no. i'm not going to let you do that you his the death of david reimer is not just on account of john money you are defending the death of david reimer you are defending his death just like how you're defending lazar paulo who told someone who's a recovering right he's a recovering trans uh person whatever he's Becoming straight, basically. He's finding himself again. Lazar Paula told him to kill himself because he was recovering from that. I'm not joking. There's literally a video titled that. Lazar Paula told me to kill myself. There's an actual video title. So, this is the kind of people that we have to deal with, okay? So, we're already off to a gate start. So this is not none of this is in the church files. Do you think that your identity as genderqueer is related to your experience being on the autism spectrum? Yes, 
I have difficulty fitting into other regulated social roles due to being autistic and the way my brain processes sensory data. I'm very sorry that you have a lot of mental illnesses. Uh, that's very sorry, but this is very deeply tied to other areas of my life. However, I would like to stress that this does not mean I am somehow broken or that there is something innately bad, disordered, or unnatural about being autistic. The same will apply to any other form of that. Uh, is it true that there is nothing innately bad or like should we make fun of autistic people? Definitely not. That is that is true. Is there anything unnatural with autism? Yes, it's a mental illness. You are mentally ill. So what you're doing is that you know your mental illness and you're trying to say it's not a mental illness. I'm completely fine. You're just kidding yourself. But I know better than trying to explain things to a mentally ill person. The real problem is all of the people enabling this person in their life. Their parent, you know, this guy's parents, his parents, right? His priest, which we're going to be, I think he's going to mention. The people that know about this and enable this, those are the ones that I have a problem with. Really, I don't really have much of a problem with you. Because why will I? You're mentally ill, man. Like, I can't, like, I'm not saying this to attack him. Like, he genuinely is. He's mentally ill. And he needs help. He's not getting help. And he's living in a delusion. I remember I was in a sociology class back when I was in the U.S. And they made us watch this video of um, transitioning kids, right? Kids taking hormone blockers and those uh, that kind of stuff. One thing was very interesting in that documentary... All of the kids who were taking hormone blockers who wanted to change their gender, right? So male kids were acting like they were females and whatever. All of those kids had uh, compounded mental illnesses and they even wanted to kill themselves. They were having schizophrenia. Now you might now the general cope is that, oh, that's because, you know, they're being persecuted. Well, in that documentary, actually, they had support. It was the opposite. They were supported. Right? They had friends because of their transition. Okay? And I remember during that class, maybe one of you watching this might have even been in that class. Maybe you go into the same university I went to. But I remember in that class, they asked, you know, if your kid, if you have a male kid and your male kid said, I'm a female, I want to be a girl, or vice versa, would you let them after watching this documentary? Like, the, the, the teacher's a complete liptard, by the way. Like, she, de she looks at that, doesn't she see a problem with it? So she's asking the people in the crowd, you know, what do you think? Everyone was supportive. They said, yeah, this is good. Like, these kids just need support. When they literally spent one and a half hours watching a documentary to see what happens when you, quote, support these kids. They want to kill themselves. Now, if I have a kid, I don't want my kid to kill himself, okay, or herself. And in fact, I remember this. There was a guy in class, okay, there was a dude, there was a guy in class who, um, who said, you know, who made a very good argument. He said, we don't even let kids, um, we don't even let kids drink when they're five or six or seven, but yet we somehow let them, like, change their gender and take hormone therapy and just, that just makes no sense. And everyone in, I don't, I'm not kidding. Like the hundreds, like 200, 250 people in there were all booing him for saying that. Okay? So this is the kind of world we live in. So if you want to affirm this person, well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's your decision. But I'm not going to do that. I am not going to do that kind of stuff. Let's move on. Okay? I mean, like... The fact that he's trying to make it seem okay that he's autistic, I mean, again, like, if you're autistic, yeah, like, that sucks. Um, but he's trying to make it seem as if it's not a big deal. And that is just, that is just not true. That is just a disservice to autistic people. <laughs> okay? How is the term gender queer related to your gender identity? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do the Lydia was the term gender queer related to your gender identity and your sexual orientation why have you chosen these particular words to describe yourself after i came out to myself and took ownership of being non-binary 
I began to experience both romantic and sexual attraction differently. I identify as pansexual and panromantic, not in the sense of a specific attraction to all genders, but that another's gender doesn't significantly impact my attraction to them. I have had intimate romantic relationships with partners of several gender expressions, cis, trans, non-binary individuals. Damn, bro, you had more you had more experience than I had in my entire life. You are a king. Of course, if you're a if you're a libtard who uses the term insult unironically, you will think this guy is like, wow, this guy is getting so much whatever. If you don't even know what he's getting, but he's getting so much whatever he's getting. It's like, wow, great, but this is mental illness. What I find most attractive is a person's personality. Yes. I used to I used to be like that too when I was 10 years old. I used to be like that when I was 10 years old too. Um that's not true. When did, when did you realize you weren't binary? I think it's always been there looking back on my life. I've always wondered what does it mean to be a man? No descriptions of manliness felt very natural to me. It's not supposed to feel natural if you it didn't feel natural to me. No one cares what you think in that matter. Manliness doesn't care what you think. It's, just, it's as simple as that. Okay. A lot of it felt horrifying. Some of the times in my life when I have done things that have been most in conflict with my own values were when I was trying to fit into someone's idea of what manliness was. So basically, you, you were, a, you were a, a cat. You were basically a cat. A lot of that came from the church. Uh-oh. So a lot of the manliness that he opposes comes from the church. So that shall give you an idea what's going on. This guy's rejecting the church's teachings now. From whom specifically? I'm thinking of things like youth retreats where they divide kids, uh, kids up according to gender, talk to them about what it means to be a man or a woman. More recently, I read comments online like orthodoxy is like Christianity, but tougher. It's a manly religion for manly men. There's always this undercurrent of aggression and dominance, being stalwart and stoic, but that's just not who I am. So, that tells us a lot about you. <laughs> it just tells us a lot about you, ma'am. I'm not supposed to be laughing, but... That just tells us who, you, what kind of a person you are. So you're just coping. You're just, you're just coping. You're just coping into thinking you're this weird gender. You're coping into being this money gender, this John money gender. Then you really here's the here's the here's the reality check that no one provided to him directly. Okay, because everyone was too busy being nice to him. Here's the reality check. You're a weakling. Okay, you're a weakling. You're autistic, you're mentally ill, that sucks. But you are a weakling. Okay, now there's a certain part of it that is because of your mental illness and you're born with it and that's a tragedy and that needs to be worked it. But there's a certain other part of it that you can change and you refuse to change that. Okay, and that needs to be told. So now people are going to say, oh, he's shaming mentally ill people now. David, he's now... After being pro-genocide, he's now shaming mentally people. No, no, I'm not shaming mentally ill people, okay? I know a lot of mentally ill people. Maybe I am even one of them. I'm probably not. Um, I've known many mentally ill people in my life. I've known many people, in fact, in my life um, as a teenager, I've had homosexual confide themselves to me, telling to me, yeah, I'm homosexual, I like men, what can I do, man? I even like you. What like what can I do? And they confided in me. I had a I had I had a good talking to them. Obviously, I didn't do any of that nonsense. Obviously. If I did that, I won't even mention this. <laughs> I will keep this hidden with me. Um But every time I told them the same thing, every time I said, look. It's a tragedy, you have all these problems, yes, but there is a fa fraction where you yourself can make a change. That you yourself can say, yes, um, I can't just cope. Like, I have to do something. And again, where is the church fathers in this? I mean, this is an article, this is supposed to be about orthodoxy. And when you hear about orthodoxy in Christianity, you think about scripture, Christ, church fathers, where are they? 
So far, there's none of that. But I think we're going to see them soon. And uh, yeah, let's keep on reading. Actually, uh, before I continue reading, I do want to kind of dedicate some time to talk about something something else that I want to mention. Uh, some people might say, oh, David, you're being so dismissive. You're being mean and um, whatever. You're, you're attacking, okay? You're just attacking this guy. You're just being dismissive and whatever. So let's bring... Allow me to be mean because I think I'm actually being too nice. I think I'm being way too nice. Um, if I wanted to be mean, I will be reading church father quotes on homosexuals. That will be very mean because when the church fathers speak, they're very brutal. Um, if I wanted to be, be mean, I will bring out statistics, you know, the stats, the statistics. I will bring out the statistics, you know, like this. I will bring out statistics like this, you know, uh, you know, this stuff. What does it say here? Promiscuity, 28% of homosexual men had more than a thousand partners. You know, I will do that if I was mean. Thankfully, I'm not a mean person. What is that? 79% of homosexual men say over half of sex partners are strangers. That's pretty mean. Substance, alcohol abuse, sexually transmitted diseases. What is that? Mortality? It is a huge health risk. You you have a more of a chance of getting HIV. You have more of a chance to do uh, substance abuse. You use you're more likely to use illegal drugs. More likely to commit suicide. Oh, what is that? These are the citations used for this infograph. So these are sourced. So they're not just some random statements made by a random person. Oh, what is that? Uh, only 25% of those interviewed reported being monogamous? That's insane. That's not true. Actually, it is true. Do you know what a mean person will also do? Here's another thing a mean person will do. And when I, while, while I'm doing that, let me, let me, let me uh, size this properly. Okay, allow me to, so that you can read the entire thing. Uh, I'm sorry, I am a little... I'm a little stupid, <clears throat> so I'm bad at doing this kind of stuff. Uh, yes. I think you can read this a little bit. Yes, I think you can. So, um, I'm going to put this here, and I'm going to play a, a clip. I'm going to play a clip for you. And this is from... This is an interview from... Uh, Nicholas Cummings, a PhD, past president of the APA, American Psychological Association. This is a very, very important interview, okay? I want you guys to listen to this. It's gonna, I'm going to make you, I'm going to speed it up, but you're going to have to listen to this um, for uh, two minutes, three minutes. So first of all, bit. I would like to know, you've been president of the APA for several years. Um, I just would like you to refresh my memory about uh, what was the history of a reorientation therapy. When did you start to hear about this uh, this new development, and how, what can you tell me about the first reaction of the APA at that time? Uh, the, it probably started in the APA in the uh, early 1970s, and uh, at that time the women's movement was in ascendancy and it tended to overshadow uh, the uh, gay rights issue. But the two seemed to meld as they w went on. Now. We heard something very, very interesting just now. We sort of heard something very, very interesting. He points out, uh, Nicholas Cummings points out that the women's rights issues and the gay rights issues seem to meld. It's as if they're part of the same group. Isn't that interesting? It's as if all of this, all of these views cannot be separated but are actually part of the same group. So when you see a or the Christian feminist who says, oh, I'm against homosexuality, for example. No, 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 no. Historically speaking, your ideas were melded in part of the same group, actually. So let's not forget that. That's a very significant thing to highlight. Let's continue what he has to say. And, uh, you know, there was a time when I couldn't tell the difference between uh, women's rights and gay rights because it was, it involved the same people. The... It was all the same people? Now that, 
is also interesting. Remember, I had I was lynched on Twitter for attacking a second wave feminist. This guy is Dr. Nicholas Cummings is talking about second wave feminists. They were part of the same team with those who were marching for gay rights. Okay. Let's not forget that. Let's, let us not forget that. First uh, uh, time it came up, and I was a member of Consul. And this would have been, oh, 1975, because I remember that's, that's when I made the resolution. I made the resolution that uh, uh, being gay was not a mental illness. It was characterological. And it passed the Consul of Representatives. And that was the first issue that came up. I also said that uh, with that, that the APA, if it passes this re resolution, will also vote to, con to continue research that demonstrates whatever the research demonstrates. Uh, unbiased, open research it was never done. Yeah. It was never done. Uh, and the, but the. So they, tr they passed an amendment. The APA said homosexuality is not a mental illness anymore. Right, which it was considered as that. That's why you had gay rights people rallying. Con like, and by the way, if you look into the history, it was incredibly, incredibly violent. Right? You think that the right wingers, the quote, oh, suppose it like Charlotte, you think that was violent? You're a weakling if you think that's violent. The stuff that homosexuals did at that time they were way more violent. If you look into the history, these people were way more. Violent. And by the way, look look what he said. Look what he said. He says, no research was done. Okay? The past, the amendment passed, the resolution passed. They were supposed to do an unbiased, open research on homosexuality after passing it to confirm it. Now, first of all, first of all, why are the, why is the APA passing resolutions? on mental health issues before even doing research on it. That is my question. Because of public pressure. Because of public pressure, of course. That's the correct answer. And the research was never done. Now, now let's for now, let's listen to what he has to say. Uh, resolution that I made in council did get adopted. And by a wide margin. In that era, the Leona Tyler principle was paramount. That the APA would never take a position publicly that wasn't supported by scientific evidence. So, according to this principle, the APA historically has never taken a position until it was scientifically verified, right? That it had to be scientifically demonstrated. And we abided, uh, the presidents in my era, abided by the Leona Tyler principle. All of a sudden, things began to change as things became more political than scientific. The Leona Tyler principle, which was never withdrawn, disappeared. In fact, you can't even find it in the annals of the APA. If I didn't have it, uh, it wouldn't exist as far as they're concerned. But no, I had no idea, none of us had any idea that we were talking about open dialogue, research, unbiased. And uh, the uh, gay rights movement in those days didn't have the kind of militancy it has now. I mean, now it's... So... Uh... You heard what he had to say. You heard his thoughts. It's very, very clear. Okay, so when I say it's a mental illness, I'm speaking a scientific language. Okay, this is why I'm saying this. This is why I'm saying this. I'm not saying this to attack people. It's because I don't recognize the decision made by the APA because, again, uh, this is a former APA president. This is a former APA president. He himself says this. I will be linking this video in the description below. You will be able to check it out. He himself says this. So, this is not just some random dude. It's, 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 a, it's an APA president. And he admits this research was never done. If the research was never done, an open research was never done at that time. First of all, if that research was never done at that time, even if you find like some research today, do you think I'm going to believe that? <laughs> do, you think, do you think people are going to believe that? Of course not, especially at, with the way that things are going right now. Um, so I don't recognize the decision the APA made because the APA violated its own principles. I'm, a, I'm just abiding by the principles of the APA themselves. And 
It says that they're never going to take a public stance on anything unless it was scientifically verified. It's not demonstrated. There's no demonstration. So, no. Uh, I It's a mental illness. This guy is mental. So this is like a next level of that. So this is even more than... Like homosexuality is just the entry level. This is even way more than that. So, uh, yeah. So thank you for listening to me as I was being... This is me being mean. Okay, this is me being mean. This is what happens when I get mean with people. So let's let's keep on being nice, okay? Um All right, so move on. Do you oh, Lydia asks, "Do you think there is an argument to be made for too many words regarding gender identity?" No. What a what a softball question. What a softball question that that is. It's too many words. Of course it's... Okay, let's see. In my experience, the concern comes either from confusion or anger about something unfamiliar. I feel more understanding of confusion and I try to have a dialogue. Of course. The pro proliferation of different terms acknowledges the uniqueness and diversity of everybody's journey. It can certainly be difficult to express things, but I don't think that's a bad confusion. Father Thomas Hopkins said, Better true confusion than false clarity. This is the first time he quoted someone in an orthodox context. And who is it? Father Thomas Hopko? I mean, I don't hate him, but you got to be better than You got to do better than that. Are you out to many people? No, though my spiritual father knows. So the priest knows this. Okay, so don't think like... If you're Orthodox or if you're thinking of becoming Orthodox and you think this is the base Christian, well, this is the base Christianity. This is the manly Christianity. That is true. We are way better in most regards than Roman Catholics. That is true. Okay? But that doesn't mean that we don't have our problems. This is a huge problem. And the difference is that unlike the Roman Catholics, we are actually willing to admit that there's a problem going on. Okay? This is an issue that is unfortunately present. This guy's spiritual father, I'm gonna say to you straight, actually, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep it a buck fifty with you. That will be too mean. So <clears throat> um peer pressure, right? I'm like the APA, peer pressure guys. But his his spiritual father is not gonna have a nice time explaining himself to God. I'm just gonna say that much. I love my parents very deeply and I know that they love me, but it will not necessarily be out of character for them to do something to try to bring me to repentance so so we kind of get some ideas about his parents um his parents are just very weak conservatives okay they just they they think christianity is all about being weak and just being tolerant and so they're just tolerating this and just letting it be and they say oh you know we love you but I mean, we will be very happy if you stop being what you are. Which is not this is not going to work. It's, just, it's not working. I mean, hopefully it works. Hopefully, 10 years, 20 years later, maybe, you know, Lindsay, I mean, statistic I'm speaking statistically, you know. Uh hopefully Lindsay doesn't kill himself and actually becomes a man. Um, hopefully. And he doesn't have to go through that terrible experience because killing yourself is it's not a nice thing to do, right? Um, hopefully he doesn't, he doesn't do that. And, but I don't see it changing as the, as things are going with this kind of an approach. I don't see things changing. Do you think it is ever one Christian's responsibility to bring another to repentance? No. What? No. So it is not our job to... No, repentance is a gift from God, and it only comes from hearing the proclamation of the good news. I value living honestly and openly, and I will come out to my family when I'm ready. So his, his family doesn't know yet. With regards to the church, I do not believe anything about my life or my identity is unnatural, sinful, or harmful. So he was apparently sleeping when he was reading the Old Testament, he was apparently sleeping when St. Paul was talking about homosexuality. He was sleeping when uh, looking at the researchers on homosexuality. Um, he was apparently sleeping through all of that. And look at what we just talked about. 
even on a secular perspective, it is very obviously uh, harmful. You just need to look at St. John Chrysostom and various different church fathers, what they say about homosexuality, what the scripture says about homosexuality, what God says about six, uh, homosexuality. You just need to look at all of that. Now, people will make this argument, but you see in Leviticus and it's saying that you should uh, redact that homosexuals, you know what I'm talking about, Leviticus, and they will say, oh, but that's fulfilled. But, I mean, isn't it interesting? Like, why, why was that there? Like, you isn't that a good question to ask? Like, why was that a thing in the first place? You know, that's a good question to ask. And uh, why did St. Justinian, you know, St. Justinian, why did he, uh, I mean, he will torture homosexuals in public. And the church didn't see any problem canonizing someone who does that. Now, was he wrong in doing that? I mean, supposedly, according to this person, Apparently, St. Justinian just murdered numerous different people. But yet he's somehow a saint? That doesn't make any sense, does it now? Well, of course, uh, nothing makes sense if you're an alphabet soup person. Uh, I can live fully as a faithful follower of Christ and the Orthodox Church. No, you can't, and you aren't. However, with very few exceptions, many priests will see my identity as a reason to bar me from the sacraments. They are correct. Um, to be cut off from Eucharistic celebration with the fellowship of Christ will be like a spiritual death sentence to me. No, actually it's the opposite. You uh, celebrating the Eucharist as the way you are is your death sentence. Your priests that are allowing this are actually murdering you in front of you uh, very slowly. And you're only going to realize it. If you don't repent, you're only going to realize it after you die. Now, if you want to listen to me, that is fine. I, I gave my warning, right? When I die and give an account to myself to God, I'm, this is not going to be brought up, okay? God's going to look at this and say, you warned him. Maybe you could have done a better job. You know, who knows? You could have done a better job. Everyone could have done a better job. You could have done a better job, man. Of course, I could have done a better job. But at least I did my duty. Rest is up to you. If you want to live your life, if you genuinely believe that, like here's a, here's a question you need to ask these people. If you genuinely believe that, like, seriously, if you believe that, then at that point, there's no discussion. You don't need a discussion. Just walk away. He made his decision, okay? And God is just. He's also merciful, but he's also just. And what is going to happen to him is going to happen. If you want him to be good, well, you have to pray for him, and you have to criticize people that promote this. Of course, just praying is not going to be enough. What does James say? Faith without works. What is faith without works? Dead, right? So you have to have a living faith. Living faith is with prayer, but it's also by working, by manifesting that faith, faith as a person. Um, the Orthodox Church teaches a very binary model of sexuality, and it opposes... Op opposes opposes homosexuality if you were out to others how do you think your identity will be received in this landscape so lydia just already admits that your orthodoxy is against this i will be a pariah in the orthodox church you should be if i were unapologetic i will be excommunicated you should be many priests are privately affirming now if this is true this is a little bit of alarming right but even the most affirming pastors will discourage myself and others like me from being out of the community because it will cause a split in the parish this is very critical okay this is actually very 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 significant okay if orthodoxy is gonna die it's gonna die because of priests like this okay these priests you know what should happen to them i cannot say i will be banned on youtube but um the, if, if orthodoxy in America is going to go through a lot, it's because it's going to be... These priests are weaklings, okay? It will be an insult to the priesthood for me to call them priests. Obviously, they're priests. I'm not a donatist, but it will be an insult to the priesthood that they are priests, okay? Um, that's what I want to say. And this is also why this is kind of like a... I want to send you guys... This is my dog whistle to you. It's not a dog whistle. If you are based, right, quote, based... If you are Orthodox, if you're an actual Orthodox Christian that believes in the Orthodox faith, believes in Christ, believes in what the fathers say, what the fathers have kept, even if you're inadequate, right? Unless you're severely inadequate, this is your call 
to consider priesthood. That's all I'm going to say because this is alarming. Okay, I will rather have an inadequate priest who has a good heart than weakling priests like this. Okay, this is a call to consider priesthood. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, this is my little dog whistle to you guys. And I'm the first person who's very serious about these things. And I always tell people, you know, have you thought about this? But this you really seriously need to consider. Um, okay. The, uh, the only way it will be permissible is if I said I was going to spend the rest of my life flagellating myself and living in celibacy. That's not who I am. And that's not what I want to do. The assumption that the only truly joyful way to be sexual is in a married monogamous one. It's not only homosexuality. It's polygamy too. Monogamous heterosexual relationship is wrong. On what account is this wrong? What are you going to cite? Like, what is your argument on this? You can't cite scripture. You can't cite church fathers. On what account is this wrong? God doesn't approve it. The church doesn't approve it. Scripture doesn't approve it. So how do you know that's wrong? Do you have this access to super divine morality that we cannot access? That you know that this belief that is nowhere in the church, right, is actually bad? You know this, but we don't. Do you know what you sound like? You sound like a Gnostic to me. Why do you think priests who will privately compassionate will be privately compassionate will fear a parish rift if you are publicly out? We're not allowed to have conflict in churches, or if we are, there's a very narrow range of things we're allowed to fight over, like the calendar. Orthodoxy, it, as it is in America, has lost sight of the Catholicity or universality of the church. Now, if you read... If you read God's Shadalic, or if you've seen my God's Shadalic series, Catholicity does not mean universality. Catholicity means the wholeness of the faith. That means the entirety of the faith, not the faith being acceptable by everyone, but the faith that is whole. That's what it means. So, um, and if you read any church for that's what they understand Catholicity. What what it means, the wholeness of the faith, not everyone accepting it. Okay, should we should we try to make the faith acceptable to Satanists? Oh, the Satanists are going to be, oh, you know, that's cool, but I don't like the part where you worship a god. Can you, like, remove that part? Should we, like, just say, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. You can keep everything, just, you know, remove the god part. Of course not. It has to be the entirety. And the entirety includes the monogamy aspect, the heterosexual aspect, okay? It's as simple as that. Christ is for all of creation without exception or conditions. Yes, that is not an argument. You think that's an argument? That's not an argument. Everybody by default is included. And we betray the work of Christ when we say a particular person or group of people is not welcome in the church. This is... You remember my Sacred Heart video where I said the, the that argument was in the top five worst arguments of all time? This is... It's not in the top five. It's not that bad. Uh, not, all, not all time, but this year this is not that bad this is this will make it in the top 15 this is definitely in the top 15 worst arguments i have ever heard in my uh in in 2021 definitely um definitely in the top 15 it's going to definitely guaranteed stop uh, spot in the top 15 it's just a very bad argument um everybody by default is included so if everybody in default is included and everything by default is included that includes sin Ro, that includes sin too. So is sin completely acceptable? Christ is for all of creation without exception or conditions and whatnot. That doesn't, from that to there, that doesn't make sense. If that was the case, then why did Christ give commandments? If Christ is for, let me give you this argument. Okay, 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 okay. You're going to love this. You're going to love this argument. If Christ is for all of creation without exception or conditions, and that is the argument you want to use for why we should accept homosexuals, then shouldn't we use the same argument for people who are Nazis and people who want to burn people like you? Should we not make use of that argument as well? If you're going to hide behind your priest and say, 
priest, he wants me to burn me. Well, all, all that guy has to say is, well, you said that Christ accepts everyone, so he accepts me too. So let me do what I want to you. <laughs> but at logic, of course, logic with alphabet, alphabet soup people, of course, that doesn't make any sense, right? What drew you to want to become a priest? So this freak wants to be a priest now. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's have fun. I completely fell in love with participating in the services directly as an altar boy. I loved the incense and the candles and I studied how services were put together. That's where I feel at home and I feel that very strongly. Aesthetics, fa a aesthetics people. This is what you sound like to me when you talk about aesthetics, okay? This is what you sound like to me. Also, as time went on, I felt what Nadia Bolz Weber calls becoming a pastor when other people make you their pastor. All you need to know about who Nadia Bolz Weber is is to just look at this. This is that thing's uh, inspiration. This, uh, this, this is their inspiration, okay? There's, wow, very good inspiration. Uh, people came to me vulnerably asking for spiritual counsel. People came to me. People come to... Okay, why will someone come to a... a an autist for spiritual counsel. Like, why will they do that? That just makes no sense. But people are stupid. That confirmed my calling. At seminary, when people asked, oh, so this guy is a seminarian now. Isn't that interesting? Why are you here? My only half-joking response was, because people keep confessing their sins to me. Growing up orthodox, what were you taught by your church community and your family about sexual identity? I mean, people keep... I mean... Man. Now, that's a, that's a thought. <laughs> that's a thought. Um, of course, there's a potential that this is literally just made up. It can be possible that it's made up. I don't think so i don't think this is made up is that's the kind of depressive thing is this we have people like this so if you feel that you don't deserve to be a seminarian if you feel like oh i'm not fit to be a seminarian i'm just not people like this are seminarians keep that in perspective every single people every single actual orthodox christian should try to be a seminarian after reading this after seeing what kind of people become seminarians I'm not joking. Every one of you should actually like consider because this is what American priests, this is, this is what they have in supply. It was never touched on in my family, in church, masturbation, sexual fantasies, or any form. Nah, I'm not going to read this stuff. It's always with the promise that the only way you'll have awesome, not reading that, is if you're married, is if you, or once you're married, is if you keep your virginity until you're married. That's like saying you'll only be awesome at basketball if you set foot on a court for the first time when you're 30. Wow. Okay. I, you know, I was kind of, I kind of thought, okay, I know now, yes, you are autistic. There are only two options for sexual identity. You're either a good, right, straight person or you are gay. There is no bisexuality. There is no tra trans Sex equals gender, and there's only two of them. Yes, that's true. Um, you know, you know how many you know how many genders there are. It's the same same number with how many natures Christ has. Booyah! If you're attracted to the same as what you are, then you're broken and need conversion therapy. Yes, you do. At best, it's look at this poor sinner. He can't help himself. He's got a disease. Yes, that is also true. And this was almost held up as a fate worse than death. Yes, that is also true. Uh, it's the same attitude toward new neurodiversity and vaccination. I will rather my child die of mumps than for them to end up being autistic. By your logic, you're supposed to not have any problems with that. But of course, logic is not the... I mean, again, trying to tell logic to a mentally ill person, like, that's, that's vain. 
We're only halfway through this article, by the way. Well, not halfway, but kind of halfway. Um, but just to give you an idea, like we, the, the show has just only now started. How has your understanding of your own sexuality impacted your experience of seminary? Powerfully. Oh, this is a powerful. I hate, I hate libtard lingo so much. Michael Cunningham once said, Michael Cunningham has once said, Michael Cunningham, this. Have you noticed that he is citing more like people of the world than the same scripture? He's citing these people more. You know, that should give you a good idea. Uh, everything is about sex except sex. Sex is about power. Yeah, this guy is Michael Cunningham. I don't know who he is, but he's also st he's also stupid. Uh, the subject of sexuality undergirds a lot of discussions in seminary. Almost every topic in pastoral theology also had a connection explicitly or implicitly with somebody's sexuality or to marriage. I'm going to guess that that's false. I'm going to guess that you're just a pervert who thinks everything is about sex. Because you literally like made this, you literally, like if you believe this, you're going to have that kind of view. So if someone is talking about two natures, you're probably, oh yeah, two natures, it's probably about sex. Because that's what, that's the kind of a person that these people are. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that's a lie. Oftentimes the discussion ends with, if we say this, we're opening the door to allowing gay marriage. In most cases, in seminary, marriage equals sex and sex equals marriage. Yes, that's exactly the view of the Old Testament. Uh, that is definitely true. That's in the scripture. One of the few ways that sex is explicitly addressed in seminary is with the notion of sex and pornography addictions. For a long time, I had a very distorted view of sexuality. You still have. I was sexually acting in ways and doing things that were in conflict with my values at the time. I started going to a 12-step group for sex addiction. It was the first place where I could honestly and vulnerably talk about what sexuality meant for me. Blah, 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 stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, what is, uh, yeah, this, this stuff doesn't matter. You, you basically went to a mental, mentally ill person to affirm your mental illness. You're coping. I said, okay, under the assumption that people are divided into two genders, what did the church father say about why that is? What I found out is they don't, uh, uh, each person who wrote on the subject said something different, which is incompatible with the others, which blew my mind. Uh, I will be interested to see you prove it. No, there's no proof of that, of course. Because I thought that all the fathers agree on everything. Now, whoever made you think that is just as stupid as you are. Because if you read St. Vincent of Learns Combinatorium, he himself admits in chapter 10 that sometimes there are church fathers that say different things. Because what we believe, we don't say all the church fathers say the exact same thing. Then that will mean that reading one church father will mean reading everyone. That's a stupid idea. And, 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 you know, of course, I'm, I'm sorry, you're autistic. So, of course, you're going to have stupid ideas. You have that, you have that excuse. But, um, no, we, we viewed, we view these things through the consensus of the fathers, not just what one father says, okay? We don't choose what one father we like and go with them. We look at the consensus of the fathers. So, if there's a, if 80% of the fathers are agreeing on something and 20% of them are disagreeing on that one thing, well, we're going to follow the consensus. We're going to follow the majority. We're going to follow what most of them say, okay? So, for example, uh, when the iconoclast brought out, like, only one or two people from church history, of course you're going to look at that and say, yeah, who those people, you know, whatever. There's only two people. We have, like, 50 people supporting our cause. You only have two people, and only one of them is even a saint, right? So, it's so easy. Like, that's so easy to make the argument that way. Um, that's how the iconoclast controversy... So, this guy obviously doesn't know anything. He has no clue. Which isn't kind of blah, 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 because I thought, blah, 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 It's not true in the slightest. The source with the monastic grounds was best medical and scientific information that they had. Now we have more information. Oh, guess what? No, we have more science, bro, so we know more. And we could develop things in a better way and blah, blah, blah. We are being more radically true to the traditions than simply repeating the same things that they did for a thousand four hundred years. Oh, so this guy just thinks we know more than the ancients do. Just because we have more scientific evidence, bro. You know what scientific evidence is? Scientific evidence is realizing the connection between the gut and the brain. 
You know what patristic knowledge is? Patristic knowledge is understanding that before it was even scientifically confirmed. We have various different church fathers who already confirmed the connection between the mind and gluttony. We have St. Isaac the Syrian who says, gluttony is, is a passion that fills up your mind and makes you stupid. It disables your mind. And now we have science confirming that. Or, and people are like, oh, we, have, we know more. No, St. Isaac the Syrian knew more than most of the scientists or the dietitians on the subject. Most of the people who write on fasting know more than the dietitians of today. Okay? So that exact, that's exactly a proof. That's, that's one of the proofs that you can use. So it's complete BS. It's complete BS. Just science worship with these people. Furthermore, homosexuality didn't exist as a social concept until the 1800s. That's a fat lie. Uh, that's a fat, fat, fat lie. So what, what was St. Justinian killing then? Who, who was he killing? What behaviors were incongruous with your values? At the time, it was primarily that I believed that masturbation was inherently sinful and a disorder. So this guy just keeps on giving, man. I believe that pornography was evil and wicked, and even that sexual fantasy was inherently sinful. To be frank, I also recognized myself tendencies towards how I thought about women, which I thought were bad. I had this idea coming from the church about what a relationship looks like, and it was very entire. I was taught to interact with women through thinly veiled manipulation and date gape. I knew that was... Oh, man. How is it about, I'm not even going to do female voice like this. I, this, just, this is just no comment. I look at how a specific theologian does theology. By the way, again, this guy is in the same team with the leftists, the liberals, the, the feminists. Oh, like, now he says masturbation is cool. Pornography is cool. Sexual fantasies are cool. And by the way, he does the traditional pa patriarchal view of how we should view women. That's what, do you notice what's going on over here? The feminists, right? The homosexual, the LGBT alphabet people, all in the same team. In this way, the communists, the socialists, they're all in the same team. And what do they attack? They look at this, this is fine. And they say, what is wrong? The patriarchal, the orthodox view of relationship, of woman, that is wrong. Do you notice what's going on over here? When I attack feminism, when I attack this, whatever this is, I mean, attacking the system wholesale. Everything is connected and included with each other. Disregard. This, this is the greatest proof. A look at how a specific theologian does theology more than his specific conclusions. What a nonsense statement. When I say to the church fathers, I'm not reading them to find an answer. I'm reading them because theology is a practice. What a f Oh my goodness. I want to understand what concepts they were working with and what controversies they were involved with that shaped their intellectual development. So basically, I just want to understand why they think that way. You know, I'm just a very smart guy who's analyzing them. And I just want to see how they think the way they think. Who cares what, Who cares about your analysis? You, you're, you are an autistic, mentally ill person. Your analysis is not going to worth going to be worth junk even a normal person's analysis is not going to be worth junk let alone a mentally ill person's analysis and this guy's living in his own world in his own world of cope and again who made him this way all the weakling conservative weak 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 disgusting reprobate weakling parents Weakling priests, weakling bishops, all of these people are sharing in this guy's sin. You are the reason he is this way. You should feel ashamed of yourself. You think that God is not going to notice that? Dude, God, you know, God is going to notice every single small thing any of us do. This includes me, this includes you. You think God is not going to notice? Yeah, you know, I'll let him do what he wants. What, what can God do to me anyway? You think, you think that? You think that? Have fun seeing him, okay? Have fun seeing him. You're going to have a lot of fun. You know, I'm, I might have a lot of fun seeing him too, myself, okay? Maybe I might, you know, maybe I might be in the same boat. But you, actually, we're not going to be on the same boat because your boat and my boat are two completely different. You know, 
I am a very, I'm the worst of all sinners. My friends are a bunch of people who constantly sin and I've badly influenced them in every single regard. But you know what? I and my friends, we never try to defend our sin and rationalize it. We never do that. I know that sometimes I'm a very toxic person. I do understand that. And sometimes even knowing that I'm toxic, I never defend toxicity. I defend quote unquote meanness. I never defend toxicity. There's a difference between the two. Or I never defend whatever the things that I do, which I'm not going to disclose right now to you because why should I do confession publicly, right? Uh, well, actually, ideally you should be doing that. Actually, that's the best way to do it. But I'm too much of a weakling to do that. But the point is, we never try to defend our sins. Like, imagine someone who is a right-wing extremist. Well, that's a bad example. Imagine someone who is a complete natsock comes into the church and he just rationalizes his belief exactly this way. Oh, that's just wonderful. Let's just let's just have these people do this, right? Um, I want to understand what concept. And by the way, I've seen people on Twitter who are. Um, all the like the sane or the normie sane people like you normie sane people you also do you think do you also believe that you're innocent from this oh no 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 you people you people disgust me more than this guy in fact this guy doesn't disgust me i feel sad when i i don't even want to say sad because i really don't feel anything about this guy in fact honestly i don't really care about this guy to be honest with you, that's a weak weakness I have. I don't really care. It's, to me, I look at this and it's like, yeah, you know, I don't really care. But uh, I should not, not have said that Turkish statement. Turkish Christians, I apologize. I'm a very, I have very, but I'm, I'm, I'm so riled up. I don't even know what I'm supposed to say, to be honest with you. I'm just lost for words that people like this. Oh, yeah. It's the same normal people. Yeah. You say normal people, you guys who constantly attack people who talk against this, you're like, oh, you know, uh, you guys, you ortho bros, you're too mean. You think you're safe? You think you guys are safe from this? You enable this too, right? You constantly associate yourself with it. And I see priests on like, that's the thing. The reason why I believe this is I see priests on Twitter just talking to these people as if they're normal. Just talking about this as if it's normal. I see Twitter priests that do this all the time. Now, first of all, if you're a priest that goes on Twitter regularly, first of all, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? The only good way of you using Twitter or social media is if you follow no one, you friend no one, you just have people follow you and you just say what you want to say. That's the only good way of using social media if you're a priest or a monk or whatever. Okay, um, in this day and age, especially. But you just consider enable them, just let them do what they want, and you criticize the people that are trying to protect the church's practices. You think you're gonna be safe? Every single one of you listening to this, you might dislike, you might download this video, you might say David is a meanie. I don't care. I don't care because. It is not me that's going to go to hell for doing this kind of stuff. I might go to hell for doing other kinds of stuff. I don't deny that. But I'm not going to... If I'm going to go to hell, I'm not going to go to hell because I consciously enabled homosexuality. I'm not going to go to hell because I enabled heresies and heretics. Okay? I'm going to go to hell because of other reasons. If I'm going to, you know, if. And that's a different topic. But if you don't repent... You know, that is going to be what's going to happen to you. So you might say, don't judge or whatever. You might use all of these copes. It's true. It is true. And you can learn your lesson today. You can learn your lesson in five months. You can learn your lesson in five years. You can learn your lesson in 55 years. Or you can learn your lesson when you die and you see God, when you pass through the toll houses and you say, oh, maybe I shall not have done that. So that's your choice, man. Have fun. Anyways, um, the writings of St. John Chrysostom evolved from a dualistic, monastic, dualistic. First of all, do you even know what dualism means? I don't think you do. Monastic worldview to a more inclusive one after he ministered to women and married people as a bishop. 
Do you know why? I have a very easy answer. In fact, this is a, such an easy answer that even an inquirer can come up with an answer. Because first of all, I'm going to give you the basic language answer. The standards of being a monk and the standards of being a lay person is obviously different. But, you know, I can't blame you because as I said, you're, you, as you said, you're autistic. So it's very normal that you can't figure this very easy to understand distinction out. I mean, I'm not even ins insulting. Like, autistic people can't understand this stuff. They're unable to. This is why they should not do theology. Um, but another reason is, another reason is just economia. Like, to connect it to, like, not in a, like, a more detailed explanation of that. It's, it's economia. is because it's not, it's not that he's denouncing everything he said. It's that he realizes the weakness of people and he's accommodating to them. That is not a denial of his monastic worldview. World On the contrary, it's an affirmation. It's an affirmation. Okay? People think economia just means, oh, you know, the, the, I can break the rule card. If you believe that, you're as autistic as this guy is. Economia just means I am doing something that is not the good thing to do, but it's the best thing to do in the scenario that it is. I'm not supposed to do this. I'm breaking the rules by doing this. This is a bad thing that I'm doing. But if I try to follow the rules to the letter, the outcome will be worse, right? Which is why, although we don't work on Sabbath, when we see our friend in trouble in Sabbath, we do work for him. We help him. That's completely normal. That's what Christ says. This is the principle applied. When Christ said, uh, when Christ made that point, he wasn't denying the Sabbath. Okay, he wasn't denying the Sabbath in the Old Testament. But again, this guy's autistic, so he doesn't understand this. this thing. And he never, he, the, the thing is, he never will. Like, that's the problem. He never will, not because he's stupid, but because he's autistic, because he's, he has that condition and autistic people can't understand these things. And we have to, we have to realize that. We have to understand that. It's not me being mean to autistic people. That's just the truth. That's just how they are. The fathers were devoted to the church, to Christ, and to academic work. Gregor of Nyssa is called the father of fathers. He was also a universalist. We can't ignore that. Oh, no, now he's preaching universalism. That is integral to his entire theological worldview. Everything he writes is based on the assumption that all of creation is destined for union with God. Have you ever read St. Maximus's view of the apocatastasis? You haven't. It's very, it's very clear that you haven't. We can't because... He talks about how we can be in union with God and how this can still be a hellish experience. I mean, if you scorn the laws of God and if you scorn who God is in this present life, do you think you're going to have a fun time seeing Him and being in union with Him? No, you're going to hate that. Okay, this is not, there's no need for none of that David Bentley Hart nonsense where David Bentley Hart stupidly thinks that, oh, you know, when we die, we're just going to make the best decision after we die. First of all, first of all, uh, many of the church fathers point out that there is no repentance after death. And there's a very good reason because the activity of your soul is during when you're living, when you're alive. In death, you don't have that activity, that volition to move your soul to make decisions, to change your decision in the first place. That doesn't even exist. Okay. Now, of course, there is still volition. There is still movement. There's ever moving movement, but it's the... Think of it like this. this is going to be a bad analogy, but think of it like this. Think of it like um, your entire life is saved on like some file and it's just processed into the other realm. And it's basically being proceeded. It can't be changed. You can't change the files. It is as it is. But the the experience is going through. It's still like going there. It's As I said, it's a very bad analogy. I'm just using it to help you understand what I'm talking about. This is why, for example, many of the... When, when, when Christ preached the, in Hades, people could accept the gospel because while they were living before the gospel, they lived their lives as if they would accept the gospel, right? They were the kinds of people that if you brought the gospel to them at the end of their life, they will say, yeah, I believe this. This makes a lot of sense. That is why they accepted the gospel in Hades. And then there were people who did not accept it because look at how they lived, okay? So this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, 
There is this incredible intellectually dishonest move of saying, we've already figured out what all the fathers say, all the fathers agree on everything. If the fathers come to a different conclusion, then we either ignore it or make it go away, or we try to squeeze it to feel the you know, you know, we just listen to what the consists of the fathers say. We don't listen to what... If one father goes against the other fathers, that means that that father is wrong. Most of which have nothing to do with authentic orthodoxy. It's this weird American evangelical or pseudo-scholastic Western view that has been dressed up in cask and incest. Notice this. Notice this. Have you ever been called a evangelical or a Western view kind of a guy? This is the source of it. If someone, that's that's so funny. Like it, it it is so funny because I've been called a Protestant numerous different times on YouTube on Twitter. Or like, I, like as if like I came from, I was never a Protestant in my entire life. I didn't even know what Protestantism was three years ago. Okay. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know what Protestantism was to be honest, two years ago, to be honest with you. And to be honest with you, I don't even know what Protestantism, to be honest with you, fully is. I mean, I know what Protestantism is, but I don't like, if you ask me to give you a history of Protestantism, here's my answer to you. Martin Luther did a poopy and uh, they fought with Roman Catholics and then uh, people schism and schism and schism and now everyone has autistic beliefs and none of them agree with each other. That's my view of Protestant history. Just to, to be honest, probably very accurate, but it's a very basic, you know, basic baby view. I know the basic views of Calvinists and Lutherans and, uh, and, all, and all those people. I know what they're saying, but like I get called a pro because... The people calling you a Protestant, they're the Protestants. That's why. That's the that's what I'm getting at, basically. They're the Protestants. So this guy, he is the Protestant. In fact, to be honest with you, calling him a Protestant is an insult to Protestant. Protestants. He should be called an Oriental. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh some might say that the Western culture is obsessed with sexuality and that non binary sexuality is a direct outgrowth of this cultural trend. How would you respond to this claim? Western culture is a highly problematic term. We have inherited a heavily distorted view of sexuality from the Victorian era, which kept a lid on sexuality and the sexual revolution of the 60s. So now, sexual revolution is a good thing. Some feel that we should try to metaphorically show the toothpaste back into the tube. Oh, yeah, of course, of course, you're going to find a. I mean, I know the. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it is not. I know it's probably not sexual, but of course this guy will find a metaphor about... Of course this guy will use a metaphor about showing things, showing something to something else. Of course. Of course. I do have everything. Social discourse around sexuality is heavily distorted. The answer is not to attempt to return to make... The golden age where queer people, right? We could blah, 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 blah. More constructive. No, I don't care. This is just a bunch of noise. I imagine some people read this into it and say the secular world has poisoned the way you understand sexuality. Yes, it did. That's the genetic fallacy. Yeah, you're a dumbass. It's a purely rhetorical move that ignores the actual argument. Yeah, you're a dumbass. Labeling it invalid because it is secular without addressing the details. Oh, the details are addressed, actually. I addressed the details to you just now. What are you going to do about that? The idea that you must mistrust everything that isn't Orthodox Christian raises all kinds of questions about what Orthodox identity is anyway. Do you see this sentence? Do I even need to comment? So, if you mistrust, mistrust everything that is not Orthodox Christian, then what is your Orthodox Christian identity about anyway? It's about Orthodox Christianity. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Do you believe there is room in Orthodox theology for a broader understanding of gender? Yes, St. Gregory of Nyssa says gender is one of those things that is an aspect of a person, but it is not essence, essential to being human. Uh, Orthodox Christians are uniquely positioned to affirm non-binary identity and sexuality because unlike the Catholic Church, oh, beautiful. We do not have a medicine which has already dogmatically defined this for us. Newsflash, if, if, if it is true that we don't have anything that dogmatically defines these things for us, there will be nothing that will be dogmatically defining things for you either. Okay, so this is this is just proof enough that it, when you see people attacking all oh, the Western view is like this, or Roman Catholic view like this, ask them, what specifically are you referring to? If they're referring to the magisterial view, know that those people are not Orthodox. Um, there is a, you can say, magisterial view in the Orthodoxy, right? That's reception. 
that's the catholicity of the view that's the universality and that's the uh uh antiquity of the view read saint vincent of Laurentius communitorium he explicitly states states how we know what a dogma is how we know what a doctrine is how what we know a sound doctrine is what this guy is doing i mean have you ever read galatians 1 saint paul says if anyone else brings a, a different gospel whether it is me whether it is the the apostles so he even includes the apostles which includes peter uh if it is me, if it is the apostle, if it even is the angels, if anyone brings you a strange gospel to you, let him be anathema. He says this in Gal Galatians 1. He starts Galatians with this. And we're supposed to... So what is this other than that? Bringing... So there is one gospel, right? One doctrine, dogma. There is a dogma that you cannot go against. And bring something else. Yeah, patristic, theological, theological, theological. We are not bound solely to interpretation of the scriptures. It is an essential part of the tradition, but does not. Yeah, do you see, like this kind of this kind of talking point. This is why I don't. This is why I don't bother using these talking points because. Um, it's technically true, but now that he said it, it's completely false and it's completely to be opposed. Be just because he feels he says it. Um, because the way he thinks it is, is absolutely completely heterodox. Now they're talking about capital T. Yeah, you see like the whole capital T, smaller T tradition. No, man, I don't believe in that distinction. I actually like this is a huge take. I don't believe in that distinction. I actually think small t and capital T traditions are actually capital T altogether because they're all part of, I mean, is there, is there like, do we treat them differently? Of course, there's a different aspects to it. I'm not denying that, but they're all part, just as indispensable. They're very important parts of Orthodox Christian tradition. So we can't, we can't just define them as small t tradition and say, oh, we can get rid of the small t tradition. No, 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 no. You have to have a very, very good reason to adapt. St. Basil gave us very, very, very good reasons to adapt. You're not St. Basil, okay? So, um, anyway, I have a somewhat more limited understanding of what capital T tradition is. Uh, of course you have. According to my view of tradition, what is dogmatically binding upon the conscience of an Orthodox Christian is fairly limited and the history of tradition is more about method and practice than it is about... So do you see? Do you see? This is exactly the same view that you see from all of these pietists. That they're like, oh, you know, dogma, really what matters is about... It's just method. It's, it's the ritual and, and, and just praying, man. That's just what matters the most. All this theology stuff, they don't actually matter. Right, the, the specific conclusion of propositions uh, are less important. So here is what we see is what I will call a dialectic between mysticism and scholasticism. This 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 person is doing is heavily favoring mystic the mystical aspect of theology uh, more than the scholastic aspect, which is really tearing theology into two pieces. It is dividing the theology from what is no the scholastic and the mystical aspect. The scholastic meaning, the academic, the, the logical, the, that aspect, right? The dogmatic aspect is just as important and is connected. It's interconnected. They're both very much related with the mystical aspect, okay? So another classic example, all the heretics, the common error of all of the modern heretics today is that they separate the mystic, they separate mysticism from scholasticism. This is the common root of all of the heretics in the modern age. Do not forget this. Do not ever forget this. It's the root of all modern errors. I'm not trying to make a St. John Damascus moment, but I genuinely believe that this is ultimately the root of all errors that the Roman Catholics do, the, the crazies do, the Protestants do. They all make the same exact error. And we cannot make this error. We cannot divide. Muslims do this. Jews do this, we cannot make this mistake as Orthodox Christians because we don't make that division or separation of the mystical and the scholastic. They're both 
considered theology fully. And so you see a great example. All of these arguments, I've heard all of these arguments from normal people too. This is the kind of methodology it is. It's all part of the same team. Never forget that. It is us versus them. Do not forget this principle. It is us versus them. You're either with Christ or you're against Christ. It's as simple as that. There's only one way. Okay. If you go another way, that's the wrong way. It's the way of the Christ, the path of Christ. It's a narrow, it's a narrow path, but it's a path nonetheless. Thank God that He has given you a path at the very least, because He could have not given to you any paths if He wanted to. Natural theology is I don't care. 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 To affirm them and to integrate what we know about psychology, right? So in that sense. The Orthodox tradition is uniquely situated among Christian traditions to fully appreciate the spiritual lives of queer people, to affirm them, and to integrate what we know about psychology and biology. So, oh, lab coat moment. Lab coat moment. What would you like to see in the church with regard to the treatment of community members who do not identify with binary sexuality? I'd like to see the Orthodox church become affirming and accepting. I don't think that will happen in my lifetime. In fact, I, inshallah, inshallah, Sen cehenneme gittikten sonra da I'm, I'm even mixed my language. That was too harsh. You don't talk I was being too harsh. But inshallah that never happens. Okay. I pray to God that never ever happens. Now the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of course. But I do not want canonical orthodox churches even playing with this. Like this what we have right now is already like too far. The conditions for having a discussion about these things are uh, willing to admit that you're wrong. But maybe you're not the one willing to admit that you're wrong. Have you ever thought about that? You, I was going to say you autist, but then I remember he is actually autistic. If you're going to have, for example, a conference or discussion about women's ordination, now we have women's ordination. Great, beautiful. Yeah, it's coming to possible that women can be ordained. Or that we can administer the sacrament of marriage to a couple that is not cis-heterosexual. A conversation has to involve openness on both sides. Do you see what these guys are doing? Openness on both sides. Do you see this? Lindsay, no, sorry, Lydia Bringerud is a PhD student in folklore at Memorial in St. John's. Her research focuses primarily on American converts to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. This is the freak doing research on you. Do not forget. Do not forget. When you see a PhD, when you see people doing research on you, this is the person that's doing research. So what do we tell to those people? What do we tell to those people? We tell those people, get away from me, Satan. If you want to go to hell so much, you can go there alone. Don't bring me with you. Do not bring me with you. I don't want to go to hell with you. If you want to go there so much, Lydia, if you want to go to hell so much, Go, you can go alone. There's a lot of people in there. You can have, you can party there with Origin. You can party there with Nestorius. You can party there with your boy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? You can party there with uh, a lot of the other people, right? You can party there with, with those people that you love so much. I'm not going to party with you. I don't, don't bring me there with you. Yes, more on the side of the people in power, they're the ones being challenged. In terms of just speaking in a way that is not condescending and open to the perspective of those challenging the status quo. These people think that, oh, we are just challenging the status quo, man. I would like to see affirmation discussion of non-monogamy. I would like to see the church move away from understanding lust to be sex with the wrong kind of person or in the wrong circumstances. Is sex outside of or before marriage inherently sinful? Why or why not? I think we need to dramatically reevaluate. The concept of sin and sins. I think, you know, since we're speaking of openness, let's speak, let's talk about openness, okay? Since we're talking about openness, YouTube, I'm joking, okay? YouTube, please. Burda be ekmeyim is var ya, lütfen. YouTube, please, you understand. I'm a minority. I'm a minority, man. I don't understand Western culture. I'm a foreigner. Please, YouTube, we're doing something. We're doing something here. Come on, lütfen. Burda be, burda be, bir şeyler yapıyoruz ya. Please. Please, but um, just hypothetically, just 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 thoughts, thought, you know, a thought scenario. Hypothetically, what if, you know, since a conversation, we need to, we need to challenge the status quo. So this challenge, the status quo is murder is bad. Let's do a 
challenge of the status quo of murdering a specific... Let's say, let's say someone wants to open a discussion. You know, Lydia, you, Lydia and Lindsay, you both affirm that a conversation has to involve openness on both sides. So I want you to be open about a discussion on, you know, whether we can hunt down homosexuals and kill them. Why don't we do a discussion on that? You know, because we, I just want a conversation. A conversation needs to have both sides. Look, YouTube, I'm not saying we should. Do, in fact, we should not do that. But maybe, we, you know, as a thought experiment in their mind, should we have a conversation? I'm just saying that. YouTube, again, listen to me. I'm against that. We should not, we should not hunt homosexuals and kill them with whatever means necessary. That is... That is a thing of the past. We should not do that. Okay, we shouldn't do that. But all I'm saying here is, you know, why are they opposed to the conversation? Should they not open to be a conversation on that as well? Should they not be open to... So actually, YouTube, what I'm saying here is actually you should be banning these people because they are enabling conversations on morally abhorrent things. So really, actually, Google, my message to you, Google, Hey, Google, listen to my voice. <laughs> Ban orthodoxy in dialogue, Google. Because these people are enabling uh, evil things to happen by allowing open conversations on everything. I'm just saying this to you. Just keep that in mind. So really, they are the bad guys. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do open conversations with bad stuff. Come on. But they want to. So... Uh, you get what I'm saying? Okay, beautiful. So if if this video gets, I don't know, uh, whatever, maybe demonetized and someone will be watching this. And please, if you're watching this, this, I'm not advocating for this. I'm not advocating for any of this. I'm just bringing a hypothetical scenario, okay? Or like, not a hypothetical scenario, just using their own logic against themselves, okay? And you know, everything we do here, you know, it's just... Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a foreigner. I don't know much about American cultural context. Please help me. I'm, I'm a very innocent man. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good. Okay. I'm trying to be a nice fellow. Maybe I'm just a bit too harsh sometimes. Maybe I just don't know how to, you know, treat the public too well. I don't know how to, how to play the actor. Right. So, you know, just be patient with me. I'm a nice guy. I will count out to the party line, please. I will not count out to the part nine. Actually, I will not. But, um, yeah, you see, you see the kind of nonsense that we had to go through. And this is a very, very important video. Like this is, if you watch, you should tell your friends to watch this video. You, they don't need to be like seeing the 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 images. They can, you know, they can be right. They can be driving to church, and after liturgy, they can. Because don't listen to me before liturgy. Look, here's my advice. Don't listen to me before liturgy unless it's a theology video because I get riled up. Listen to me after liturgy if I'm getting riled up. That's a very good advice I can give to you. Um, so they can listen to it when they're driving to church and, you know, whatever. This is a very significant video because what we have seen here, that we have seen arguments... We've seen the origin of the normie, normie dogs arguments in here, right? The origin of the normie dogs arguments and understandings of Orthodox Christianity fundamentally is subversive and anti-Orthodox and ultimately even worse than Satanism, which how can you even be worse than Satanism? But they managed to do that. Good job. You, you've done a great job at doing that. So just think of this for a while and um yeah i had to show this to you and let the bishops and priests know what kind of garbage these people are saying. and by the way don't don't be don't be fooled by their don't be fooled by their oh i'm just asking questions that's their whole act that's their act okay that's their act if it was the inverse, you think they're going to let us ask the questions? Look at what's happening in U.S. politics, you idiot, you blitting idiot. You're supposed to put these people down. When I say put these people down, I'm not saying kill them. I'm saying don't let them say what they have to say, okay? 
you're not le- you're not supposed to let them say what they have to say. But if you want to enable that, normie docs, idiots, and all the people who use the same methodology as these people, have fun. That's all I can say. So thank you for watching this video. Um, hopefully this can stay up, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching. God be with you all. I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.